I'm Izati from Green Drinks KL. So today we are having our event or Reef are dying, how to save them. And together with me today, we have Shime, uh, who is also from Green Drinks KL. We are the moderators for our event today. Hi, May. Hello, everyone. What's up? Good evening. Good to see everyone here today. I'm Shime, and I'll be co hosting the lovely Isati for this evening. <laughs> Yeah, and we welcome all of you who are joining us today. So for those who, uh, of you who didn't know about Green Dreams KL before, so Green Dreams KL is an informal uh, networking event where we talk about environmental topics and issues. So be uh, before this, uh, in the past, we have held various uh, physical events in New Central, bi-monthly and usually the final Thursday uh, of the month. So we covered uh, topics from composting to biodiversity, from waste management to solar energy. But today, our event is related to the sea, which is coral conservation. Yeah, exactly like what Izati said, we used to have physical event, but due to pandemic, but just like anyone else, we are doing virtual events. And we are going to talk about another important topic for today. Uh, it's about coral reef. And if any of you have visited an island before, or if I've gone for snorkeling or scuba diving, I bet you would have seen coral reefs or probably heard by the sharp edge of the coral. So yeah, this is something very common for, for certain people. So have you seen any corals before, Isati? Yes, before this, I went to Chico Island and I've seen the corals there. And also, not to forget the Nemo, the clownfish. Ah, yeah, yeah Nemo's so are nice. often sighted with the corals. Mm -hmm. um, and but some of you may not have the chance to to see that because yeah. by the time you go for snorkeling maybe you see some white dead corals instead of the live one hence today we need to really really bring the awareness about coral reefs how they are in danger right now and further to that we need to really think about what we can do to actually save them so if you have any any burning questions please please uh, leave your questions in the comment box We'll get through that later in the Q&A sessions. So before we continue further, just I want to ask Izati one question. Just to okay, see bring it on. Done, <laughs> just to see if she has done any homework. So okay. uh, Izati, is coral an animal or a plant? Mm, I think it's an animal, but I don't know why. Who are you? you? But I don't like know you. Whether, whether it's blue or not. <laughs> Correct yes, or not. indeed. Coral is an animal. I think the sim mm -hmm. simple answer is simply because they are not a plant. Uh. No, I'm just yeah. crapping. <laughs> <laughs> Coral is an animal because they don't photosynthesize. They don't produce mm -hmm. their own food. They need to mm -hmm. rely on other source for food. Yeah. Uh, I think, um, I think Chaimin will explain in more detail and accurate manner later. Yeah, sure. Can wait to, see, uh, to listen to, to the explanation. So now it's my turn. I have a question for you. My God. Do you think corals can be seen from the outer space or not? I don't think so. We can't even spot human from the outer space, can we? No, your answer is incorrect. Because actually yeah. we can see the corals from the outer space. if it's Really? Yeah. For example, okay. in Great Barrier Reef in Australia, it can be seen from the outer space and it's so amazing. You can see the features later. Ah, yeah. It must be really huge that it can be yeah. seen from the outer space. Yes, that's hmm. true. So, uh, as we all know, coral reefs are the most diverse marine uh, ecosystem on Earth and giving shelter to thousands of uh, animal species. Millions of people like us also depend on fisher uh, for uh, fisheries, tourism, and coastal protection. But now they are facing uh, coral uh, bleaching. And so today we will learn about coral bleaching, coral restoration, and also ways to protect uh, coral reef from our esteemed speaker. So today we are very glad that we have Mr. Chiming from Reef Check Malaysia. He's a program manager of Reef Check Malaysia and also co-founder of Reef State. He has a Master of Science in Marine Bi uh, Ecology and Biodiversity from University of Malaya. Right, me? Yeah, same like me from University of Malaya. 
I knew him uh, from a few environmental projects that we did before. Mm -hmm. And I remember him as a very passionate and a very great guy. Like when he's enthusiastic on certain environmental cause or issues, mm -hmm. he will really go for it. I remember he still did, he did a very significant uh, campaign in the university called the White Coffin Campaign, which is mm -hmm. a campaign to actually ban uh, polystyrene takeaway containers in the university. So after a few rounds of campaigning, I think the UNIC really, really take note of his pledge and eventually mm -hmm. we really phase out polystyrene. So there's no more polystyrene in our UNIC. Oh, yeah. That's so inspiring. So that's it's how a, amazing a our speaker movement. is. Yeah. Exactly. So let's welcome Chiming to join us. Hi, Chiming. Hi, Chiming. Hello, Izati. Hi, Shime. Hi, Hi, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. How about you girls? Yeah, we are excited we are to yeah. really hear a lot from you today. Yes. <laughs> I'll try my best to share. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Before we start, maybe you can share with the audience, uh, why are you into coral conservation? All right, so this goes back to a long story. Um, so this happened 15 years ago. Uh, wow. But before that, just share a little bit of my background as uh, because I, I'm i from Podixon, you know, it's a coastal town. Mm. So since young, I'm exposed to the sea and ocean. Mm. Mm -hmm. But uh, it never, I never knew anything about corals, right? So mm. I used to do uh, sailing, mm. so uh, competitive sailing. So uh, mm. the ocean is like, yeah, a place where I go to have fun and recreational activity. Um, mm. I still remember we we used to avoid corals because it will damage the uh, boat, right? So we need to lift uh, what we call a center board away when mm. we pass through corals at shallow waters to avoid mm. scratching on the boat. So yeah, instead of thinking about damaging the corals, so it's more of protecting the boat rather than wow. damaging the corals. Wow, another way yeah. around. So then 15 years ago in 2005, uh, after I mm. uh, completed my STPM, uh, I was hanging around, don't know what to do. Uh, there's a chance opportunity where I join a, a marine conservation project organized by Raleigh International Kuala Lumpur. Mm -hmm. um, so it's another NGO at that time. So uh, mm -hmm. as a young 20-year-old guy, just participated uh, in this uh, marine conservation project. And there I knew about uh, mm -hmm. Reef Check. And I met some of uh, my mentors and who in the air become my friend, like uh, Mr. Key and Padro who introduced uh, Reef Check to me, yeah. So then, ever mm -hmm. since then, I actually volunteered to do mm -hmm. Reef Check surveys. Yeah, oh. until I uh, until I joined them as staff after my master's in 2015. Mm -hmm. So I've been volunteering since 2005, 2015 as a volunteer in Reef Check. Wow. And in 2015, like I joined as so long. Long. until now, yeah. Wow. So, yeah, so that's 15 so years of accommodation, yeah. <laughs> hmm. So you actually started I, yeah. So you started volunteering since uni time, is it? So two thousand five was before I entered university. Uh wow, it was at that that's time. Way back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was at that time I realized that oh, oh. this is my true calling. So mm. and then uh after Form Six, right? So we need to register for look for universities in the UPU thing. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, at, since that project, mm -hmm. uh yeah. I've determined that I want to do uh, marine biology and become a marine mm -hmm. biologist. And yeah, so that's where I got involved wow. uh, studying in marine ecology and biodiversity. It's so inspiring. Yeah, it's really yeah. Um, grateful, mm. awesome to found your calling at the very young age so that you can make really important mm -mm. and right decision at the important stage of your life. Yeah, true. Yeah. I mean, like yeah. it's a chance opportunity so now, that, that yeah. came by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, now we cannot wait to hear your sharing about coral reef. So over to you. You get the screen all for you for yourself. <laughs> okay, um, so okay. let me just uh, share my screen. All right, so what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna take you. Uh, so because this is green ring scale, right? So. Uh, I'm sure there are some people from KL who um, may not have the opportunity to go snorkeling and scuba diving, especially this year. Um, so please allow me the opportunity to take you uh, diving um, before 
I start uh, my presentation. So ignore uh, that panda hood uh, diving, <laughs> just to keep my head warm. You actually need to keep your head warm when you're in the water? Yeah, wow. uh, because we spend long time in water. What's the temperature so in the water? Oh, I didn't know that. In, in good days, you get like 29, uh, sometimes very cold, you get 27, 28. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. All right. So that's uh, a short trip to uh, one of the nicest places uh, in East Coast uh, Peninsula in Trangano. Um, so that's you can see just now. There's uh, on the background are all reefs called reefs. Mm -hmm. So let me just put project a photo. Uh, a steel photo how coral reef uh, should look like so you can see it's quite colorful um, it has these coral heart structures and we have uh, fish uh, swimming in the background uh, let me just uh, put my laser pointer ready yeah around here and we have some what we call as invertebrates hiding in between uh, these hard corals yeah so and uh, so compare that beautiful uh, coral reefs to this one here on the background um, so it fits into the topic today, uh, coral reefs are dying and how to save them. Um, so uh, basically, uh, there is opportunity for us to save them before it's too late. Um, so there's, there's things that we can do. Um, but before we go on um, how to save them, let's understand a little bit uh, what is a coral. So just now, Shimei has uh, asked a very good question. Um, so what is actually a coral? Is it a plant? Is it a rock? or it's uh, something else, right? So the answer that Shime has uh, given is actually coral is an animal. In fact, coral is uh, cousins of uh, jellyfish, right? So uh, they are actually considered animal. And this is the anatomy structure of uh, a polyp uh, in the coral. So a polyp consists, this is whole thing here is a polyp. It will have tentacles, right? And have mouth and digestive system here. So these tentacles function uh, will use to catch uh, food, right? And uh, put it into the mouth and then have a digestive system. So you can see here, nematocyst is actually stinging cells that is similar to jellyfish, but uh, in terms of corals, their stinging cell is not as uh, deadly as uh, jellyfish, right? It's not as bad as jellyfish. Uh, but if you happen to brush onto coral, sometimes uh, you will get some uh, itchiness or feeling burning sensation. So uh, whatever it takes, do not touch corals, okay? And now, people may be confusing. Uh, like Shimei just now mentioned, um, corals animal doesn't photosynthesize. But actually, corals do photosynthesize. It's a very unique thing. And the photosynthesis comes from this uh, organism we call as a zooxanthellae. It's a type of uh, algae that lives symbiotically within the uh, tissue of coral. Now, um, for the benefit of those who are not scientifically trained, what is a symbiotic relationship? It's a benefit-benefit relationship. Basically, in a simple word, is that you help me, I help you. Uh, but in a, in a good way, lah, all right? Uh, so don't take it out of context, right? You help me, I help you is a very good way. Um, so corals provide um, space um, for the zooxanthellae to live and in return to zooxanthellae, uh, photosynthesize and provide food uh, and energy to the corals. In fact, the energy contribution by zooxanthellae is up to 90%. So corals rely a lot of uh, the energy and food from zooxanthellae. All right. Um, so then how does one small organism coral becomes a coral reef? Okay, so you can see here, this is a polyp uh, and you can see the tentacles here. All right. And this is the mouth. All right. So this is one polyp, it's one individual animal, and they will reproduce asexually by cloning themselves uh, in uh, what we call as budding and form what we call as a colony. And then from this colony, uh, it will continue to grow, um, including different, different species of corals, and eventually will form what we call as coral reefs, 
right? And then you eventually will have uh, other organisms like fish and invertebrates come in and becomes a uh, coral reef ecosystem. So put it in simple terms, right? Imagine that this polyp is an uh, apartment uh, unit, right? Usually apartment unit, almost all the unit will look the same, right? So then um, colony, it's equivalent to one block of uh, apartment, okay? And then you imagine the coral reef ecosystem as few blocks or a lot of blocks of apartment and this is what we call coral reef all right so and as a uh, apartment function as uh you know uh it provides accommodation to uh occupants to human inhabitants same like coral reefs provides uh as a housing area a nursery ground for uh, other organisms right so this is how coral reef uh, looks uh is formed um, it, to put it in a different perspective, uh, as Izati mentioned, I was also a co-founder of Reef Sticks. So Reef Sticks is actually a marine uh, card game that uh, me and a few friends uh, we have developed to try to show people who do not have the opportunity to go to the ocean to understand uh, the issues um, and the threats of uh, coral reefs. So uh, we also introduced how corals are being uh, coral reefs is formed. So it start with a bare rock space area. And then we have coralline algae growing to attract uh, the coral lava. And then we have different types of uh, soft coral, hard coral start to attach themselves onto this bare rock. All right. As you can see in this card game, we also have a bar, progress bar here to show you the level of how coral reef ecosystem progressively built. So then once the corals have uh, the structure ready to become reefs, we have invertebrates coming in like sea cucumbers and sea urchins, for example. And then we have the higher hierarchy in the food chain. Uh, we have uh, reef fishes coming in. And eventually, if we have all these uh, organisms in place, it's called a healthy coral reef ecosystem. So if you play this card, uh, this is how you're going to build your reef, right? Um, so why coral reefs are important? So we know um, how coral reefs are formed. Um, then we have to understand why. So Izati just now in the beginning has mentioned a little bit uh, it is important in terms of uh, protein source and coastal protection. Uh, let me just uh, go through a little bit uh, in detail uh, why coral reefs are important. So coral reefs, as I mentioned, because of the hard structure, it works as a nursery ground for a quarter of the all marine species in the world. All right, And uh, it's also a home for about a third of all known fish species. Okay, And for the human perspective, uh, it protects 20% of the coast from wave erosion. So you can see from this picture itself, whenever uh, strong waves come in, if, you, if there's no reefs, it will just start to erode uh, the shoreline a bit by bit. And over the years, uh, with stronger waves uh, and sea level rising, so more shoreline will be uh, eroded from time to time. Right. So how does reef actually protect uh, the world's coast from wave erosion? So when you're having a hard structure underneath and then the strong wave comes in, it dissipates the energy before the waves hit the shore. So by the time the wave comes, uh, reach the shore, the energy is become less, so less erosion will happen. So that's why we have uh, coral reefs as a protection for the coast. All right. And eventually, if you have mangroves, then there's another layer of protection uh, before it hits the shore uh, or inland. So uh, in another perspective, uh, for human, um, coral reefs provide ecosystem services in terms of protein source. Malaysians love seafood. In fact, Malaysians uh, are actually one of the highest uh, seafood consuming countries in the world. Right? So we rely a lot uh, on our sea for seafood. Um, so it becomes important. But of course, uh, we need to fish sustainably. I'll explain later this one in the threats okay? section. So besides that, uh, it becomes a tourist attraction. So Malaysia is one of the popular places for people to go for holiday, for white sandy beaches, and also for scuba diving and snorkeling. Yeah. So you have seen in the video just now, um, people do take up a scuba diving license to go diving. And uh, it becomes a source of economy, not just for the uh, local fishermen, the fisher folks, where they go out fish, come and sell. That's where you get uh, fish on your table. Uh, it gives a source of economy for the fishermen as well as other tourist operators as well. Yeah. So uh, in another perspective, uh, in terms of cosmetic medicine, uh, some of the chemicals uh, found in the coral reef 
uh, are synthetically produced and can be used for cosmetic and medicine. Okay. Now, the next question is like, uh, where else can we find coral reefs? Very simple. Coral reefs is found all around the tropical region. All right. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, corals have uh, zooxanthellae living in their tissue and they re uh, require sunlight for photosynthesis. So, having uh, corals are found near to the equator because of the consistency in terms of uh, light and the temperature. Um, so temperature also will help uh, optimize uh, coral reefs. So if it's too hot, too warm water or too cold, then corals will not uh, thrive in this kind of condition. Right? So this is where you can see from the line here, the orange color ones are actually where the reefs can be found. And in Malaysia, we are very, very fortunate right? because we are located in this region called the uh, Indo-Pacific region. And in this uh, Hotspot Biodiversity Center, which is called uh, Coral Triangle, right? So Coral Triangle consists of six countries in this place, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, Timor Leste, Papua New Guinea, um, and Solomon Island. And if you can see the map, if your geography is good enough, uh, you know where Malaysia is, all right? So you can see the dark red color. This is where the highest diversity is. So Sabah uh, is in this region. And the slightly uh, lighter red, uh, which is the second um, range of the highest diversity is located here. So basically, we have more than 500 species of corals, about uh, more than 2,000 spe uh, species uh, can be found in Malaysia. Uh, even four out of seven species of sea turtle can be found in Malaysian waters. Um, but uh, leatherback now, uh, one of the four species, uh, is becoming functionally uh, extinct because we have not seen them uh, laying eggs in our shores uh, for a long time. Right, I think we last saw them in 2017. They came. Uh, one of the leatherback actually came on shore, but did not lay any eggs. Or I can't remember whether it did lay eggs, but the eggs did not fertilize. So that's one of the issues that we have. Um, and also, um, maybe for those who didn't know, uh, we have 27 uh, species of marine mammals. Um, and if you're interested uh, to know more about uh, marine mammals, uh, there's this organization called Mariset. It's currently organizing a Sayang Sayang Seagrass Festival where you can go and find out more about uh, another ecosystem, underwater ecosystem, which is seagrass, where it's home to a marine mammal known as dugong. So you can uh, read up a bit more uh, or follow their festival, which runs until uh, Sunday. Okay. Um, so we talk about uh, reef. We talk about the importance of reef. We talk about where reefs are found. So what I'm going to share with you next is how is our reef uh, health status? So the topic today is going to talk, we're going to talk about the reefs are dying. All right, so we're going to show you uh, how do we know that the reefs are actually uh, in a dire state. All right, so we have some data to show you, and this data is actually collected by Reef Check uh, Malaysia, uh, thanks to our volunteers and also uh, our partners from the uh, Department of Fisheries uh, who have joined us in the survey uh, all these years and collected uh, data on our reef health status. So I show you five years of data from 2016 to 2020. So now 2020, there's an extra here is because uh, we still have some data uh, which are not completed yet, uh, still waiting for them to come in. So I'm just analyzing based on what we already have. So now pay your attention, put your focus a little bit onto uh, the green part. So I put it in the traffic light system, right? So green is where we want to be, right? Yellow is where uh, it's a bit neutral and red is the danger zone. This uh, red is where the section where we want to minimize and increase the green section, okay? Um, so the green part is actually live coral cover, which consists of soft and hard coral. So they are living uh, corals that form the reef building structure, okay? And uh, then we have uh, this small uh, light green here, which is others, all right? Uh, it consists of things like anemone, uh, gorgonian fans, uh, hydroids, other uh, living substrates that are important to the uh, reef system. Um, and then the yellow section, we have available substrate. So this is the bare rock. Remember the uh, card game I showed you, we started off with a bare rock. So this is the bare rock where uh, available space for corals, larvae to settle down to uh, expand uh, the reef, right? So this is an opportunity for corals to be more uh, expensive. Uh, and then uh, we have sand. Sand is actually part of a normal reef ecosystem. Um, so sometimes certain places we have sandy patch, so it's fine. Um, so it's good to have a look 
at how big area is the sandy patch. Now this two red part is the one we need to pay attention that causes the problem and are actually uh, showing signs of reef that are deteriorating. So disturbance refers to um, recently killed coral, rubbles and silt. These are signs of uh, damage to the reefs. For example, uh, strong storms, uh, human activities, uh, silt usually uh, due to coastal development. So the silt get washed into the ocean and covers on corals. So these are the data that we have collected uh, to find uh, to see how we are uh, in the health status. Uh, in terms of pollution, we look at nutrient indicator algae, uh, which indicates uh, nutrient influx into the ocean. And we have a sponge, which is also an indicator of sewage discharge. So these two indicators uh, strongly suggest that there's a lot of nutrient and uh, sewage that are discharged into the ocean. And this will be an important uh, indicator for us to look at. All right. So if you look at 2016, we have about 43%. Uh, and then now if you look at 2020, uh, it has dropped a little bit. All right. But before that, in 2019, uh, we are badly affected. Uh, this is contributed uh, partly due to the uh, public storm that happened early in the year that affected uh, most of the reefs in Trungano, where they uh, hit by the tail of Pabuk. Uh, and then also contributed by uh, coral bleaching in that year in 2019. So this is where uh, the, the trend is going downwards. As you can see, every year it's actually declining. Only this year is slightly better. Perhaps uh, MCO has contributed a little bit uh, to the recovery. Right, and you look at the available substrate, which is about 20 over percent, and this is where we hope that the reefs can be expanded until this uh, pick up a little bit from this 20 over percent. All right, um, and you look look at the amount of disturbance and pollution. Um, it has a bit increased over the years. All right, and this year it's a little bit better. Uh, so hopefully that uh, this trend continues. But you can see that pollution actually still increases until now. So we do have a problem in terms of nutrient uh, discharge and sewage discharge into the ocean. So this is something that uh, we really need to look at and uh, why we gonna talk about uh, how the strategy on how to uh, prevent corals from further deteriorating, all right? So now, this graph can be very technical to some people, but it's not very scientific. I didn't do it in a very scientific way. So let me just put it in the perspective so that everybody can understand. So imagine a football field, all right? And I have this uh, percentage drawn out on a football field. So you can see our live coral cover is not even halfway to the football field, all right? So, and you can see like almost uh, the opposition uh, square where the penalty area is full of disturbance. So uh, this is where we want to try to improve the reef, try to move it towards a uh, higher uh, live coral cover and try to reduce um the disturbance on and pollution on this side so in the football terms we try to control possession more than the opposition so this is what we are trying to show all right so um when we talk about reef uh, health status we don't just look at substrate uh we also look at uh in terms of fish and invertebrates so if you look at the trend over the past uh five years uh fishes that represents uh, aquarium trade food fish and uh, live food uh fish, fish trade uh it's showing a declining trend all right, so as you can see, so these are showing that the reefs are actually deteriorating over the time. Uh, in fact, if you look at the uh, invertebrate, now ecological imbalance, we can see that it's increasing over the years. All right, so from 33% to 35%. So this shows that uh, our ecological system uh, of the reef is actually starting to become a little bit imbalanced. So this is where uh, it gives us an indication that uh, reefs actually uh, need some help. So we really need to do something to try to save them, okay? Now, what are the threats to coral reefs? So we have seen that the data show us a little bit of information that the reefs are actually deteriorating over time. Uh, let's see what are the threats. So the threats, uh, we can split into two. One is a global threat and one is local threat, all right? So global threat is more widespread, happen all around the world and big stuff like climate change, global warming, causes uh, ocean acidification and sea level rise. Whereas local threats are happening more locally, um, things like overfishing, destructive fishing, pollution, uh, runoff from land development and uh, over tourism. 
right? In fact, uh, local threats accounts for almost sixty uh, percent of uh, the threats that the reefs are actually facing. All right. Um, so, what are global threats? Uh, do we have them in Malaysia? Uh, yes, we have. One of them is the extreme weather patterns becomes more and more uh, extreme. Uh, so one of the examples that happened last year was Pabuk, uh, the Pabuk storm that uh, hit the east coast of Peninsula. So this is the reef where it's being hit uh, by the storm and they are all actually uh, dead. So you can see the transect line that we lay here. We go back to the same site and we survey every single year. And so this is the same site we saw and we can see that the reefs actually sudden uh, drop. So if you can see the data back in uh, 2019, uh, there's a big drop uh, in terms of live coral cover. So it's partly due to this. And another issue that we have is mass coral bleaching. So when we talk about mass coral bleaching, we refer to widespread bleaching that happens all over Malaysia. And uh, what bleaching means is that, uh, remember that corals have zooxanthellae. So when bleaching happens, warm water, uh, sorry, water becomes warm. So the corals cannot cope uh, with having zooxanthellae in the body. It, gives, uh, it becomes stressed. So it has to remove uh, zooxanthellae from um, its tissue. So the zooxanthellae, when they're being removed, all right, uh, the color gets white. This is because coral tissue is actually transparent in color. And what you see white is actually the skeleton of the coral. So when zooxanthellae are in the coral, they give colors to the coral. All right? But when zooxanthellae has been expelled, then you can see uh, it's white because of the tissue is transparent, right? We're well, having said that, remember, so Zentele also contribute energy and food to corals, right? So when bleaching happens, the corals have lost 90% of their food source. So they have to rely on their um, own feeding matter, which is using the tentacle to feed on uh, plankton and other small fishes for them to survive, which is only contributing 10% of the energy. So over a prolonged period of bleaching, uh, then corals will probably die. But if the warm waters uh, recover, goes back to normal soon enough, then corals can recover, all right? So um, it's very important to understand that coral bleaching doesn't mean that the coral is dying. It's actually stress having a physiological uh, response, uh, but they can recover, okay? Um, so uh, based on our record, known record, uh, we have a few uh, mass coral bleaching events. Back in uh, 1998 was the first known uh, widespread coral bleaching event. And then 2010 uh, was another one, and I was able to see how devastating the uh, effect of coral bleaching in 2010. That was my first time observing coral bleaching uh, that happened. And then throughout the few years, uh, we have some bleaching uh, in 2016 and 2017. Of course, in between, we have uh, mild coral bleaching, uh, which only affect less than 10% of corals. And 2019 uh, was a time where we have more than 50% of uh, reefs are being bleached. Right, so these are based on the observation when we do our surveys and also reports coming in from dive centers uh, or people who went diving. Um, and 2020, because of MCO, uh, we were not able to see how uh, extensive coral bleaching was. But when we were uh, allowed to travel interstate and we went out to do survey, we managed to see uh, that, managed to record some uh, information that bleaching did happen. So we, but we do not know how uh, bad it was. But uh, a few dive sites, a uh, few states where reefs are, they were bleaching, so we can consider that actually mass coral bleaching. Also, because we also received the satellite uh, data from no um, there is bleaching. Okay. Um, so, what are the local threats? So, we talk about um, global threats now. Now, coral reefs not only face global threat; it's also compounded by local threats. One of the local threats that we always talk about is overfishing. All right? Malaysians love seafood, so as I mentioned earlier on. Uh, because of that demand, so people go to fish even more, all right? But when that happens, when we fish unsustainably uh, and using illegal methods, so most large fish will be fished out from the uh, food chain. So as you move down the food chain, the size of the fish gets smaller and smaller, up to a point where you start to fish away herbivores, all right? So when you fish away herbivores, uh, fish that eat algae, so um, the algae will soon take over the reefs. So remember I mentioned just now that uh, the nutrient indicator algae are part of the disturbance, the red zone uh, from our data. Um, so we want to avoid the algae taking over the reefs because algae is a soft structure. It doesn't provide the nursery uh, or habitat to other organisms. Like I uh, mentioned earlier on, because of the cor uh, coral heart structure, it provides the shelter, right? 
So when this happens, we call it a phase shift and causes a major ecosystem destabilization. So without herbivores to control the algae, then that's what happened. Same like how uh, the grass in our backyard, right? Over time, uh, if you don't control it, if there's no um, land mower or people cut the grass, right? Uh, so then the grass will continue to grow and start to become a problem, right? So same goes to the uh, ocean, to our coral reef ecosystem. Another problem that we have in Malaysia is uh, destructive uh, fishing. So what is destructive fishing? Uh, one of the things that we have, uh, we face in Malaysia is actually fish bombing, right? It happens a lot more in Sabah. Uh, this is a way where homemade bombs, uh, they just go and throw the bombs into the ocean and blast them. So the fish will get stunned, right? Some will get uh, bloated, exploded, and then they just collect uh, those fish and then they sell it at the market. So this is how uh, one of the destructive uh, fishing methods happen all right another way is uh, bottom trolling where they just uh, put the net and troll everything from the bottom uh, so you wipe out the sea floor so this is one of the issues that we have uh, in malaysia as well um, now the very uh, common one is pollution so everybody knows that uh, pollution uh, happens all right uh, one of the biggest problem that we faced recently is actually discarded uh, fishing net so it becomes a ghost net as you can see here the nets are being stuck on the reef and the problem with ghost net is continue fishing even though it's down there. So nobody picks it up uh, and then it becomes a problem. All right. And uh, oil tanker collusion or even some oil spill that happens. Uh, like recently, uh, I think a major news uh, happened at my hometown, uh, Port Dixon. Three kilometers of beach was uh, polluted with uh, oil. So this is one of the problems that we are facing as well. Okay. Um, and highly talked about now is the single use plastic and items. And during MCO, there's a, there's a surge and increase of uh, all this single use due to our takeaway. All right, so these all become a marine debris uh, cause of the problem. And recently, uh, we have conducted the International Coastal Cleanup in Malaysia that it shows the data collection, the highest number of uh, trash in the ocean or on the coast found was plastic bottles followed by cigarette butts, all right? And plastic itself, made 75% of all the trash found in the ocean uh, uh, during the cleanup, all right? So this is one of the issues that we need to address. And uh, of course, because we uh, coral reef is an attraction for tourism, oops. Um, so when tourism becomes overwhelming, uh, uncontrollable, it becomes unsustainable. And also partly due to knowledge of people do not know corals is actually a living animal. So people tend to uh, damage the reefs, thinking that they are stone, thinking they are just rock, nothing else. Um, and so it becomes a problem for our coral reefs. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, nutrient, sewage, and industrial discharge, uh, that's one of the issues that we uh, need to look at, uh, the red zone from our data. Um, as you can see here, the black color spot here, this uh, industrial uh, or agricultural discharge. And also, when it's discharged nutrient in the water, it forms a lot of algae covering corals, and the corals will die. So the picture on the inset on the right here is how it looks like uh, once nutrient take over the reefs and when the corals die. All right. So all these things are considered uh, threats to coral reefs. So I like this picture very much. Uh, this cartoon uh, shows a very concise uh, problems uh, threats towards uh, coral reefs. So as you can see on the right hand side here, we have uh, more extreme weather, uh, warmer waters and uh, local threats uh, around this side here. We have uh, destructive fishing, oil tanker, uh, industrial and uh, land development, over tourism. So these are the issues um, that we face um, in the coral reefs. All right. Um, so, yep. So far, these are the threats on the reefs. Wow, thank you, Chai Ming. So much of uh, precious information, information. That, yeah, yeah. that we didn't know that we get, get to learn today. Uh, for those who have just joined us, don't worry, it's not the end of the session yet. We just want to recap a little on what uh, Chai Ming has covered so far, just in case uh, you just joined us. So we are talking about coral reefs today, and there's a lot of information that Chai Ming shared. I remember he said that Corals actually prevent erosion about 20, 10, 10, 20 percent. And it's, it's actually yeah. a very, 20 percent, sorry. So it's actually a very important uh, species to have 
uh, in the marine because without the corals, you actually can't really break the, the strong waves and, and prevent the erosions. And he also covered various reasons and threats that actually uh, affect the populations of corals, such as overfishing, uh, destructive bombing, uh, destructive fishing, such as uh, fish bombing, where the fishermen they just throw bombs into the 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 sea to shock mm -hmm. the fish, right? And then so that they can yep. capture the, the fish entirely, but they actually also destroy the coral in that process. And of course, mm -hmm. oil pollution, the biggest issue now, single use plastics, and also extreme weather pattern that we are experiencing in Malaysia as well that we can yep. get like really strong storm and rain throughout and it's unpredictable there's just no no more season to to uh to actually predict it just comes suddenly right and you do not yep. know the intensity and it actually destroys some of the corals but fortunately mm -hmm. for this year there's a little bit of good news despite the declining population of the corals we are seeing a little increase right for yep. for this year so mm -hmm. we, are, we are thinking probably the pandemic helps in <laughs> that sense by reducing our tourists. Human activities. The, yeah. yeah, human activities. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really, really a lot of information. Thank you so much, Isati. Okay, now Happy for those... Who, yeah, thank you. And then for those who just joined us, today uh, our topic is coral reefs are dying, how to save them. Uh, today we have our esteemed speaker coming from uh, Reef Track Malaysia to share with us uh, his experience working on coral conservation. If you have any questions that you want to ask uh, Chai uh, please do write uh, in the comment box. Uh, we will read it uh, later during uh, Q&A session. So now we're going to continue to the second part uh, which Chai Ming will uh, talk about ways to protect uh, coral reef. Over to you. All right. Um, so um for this talk I, i'm gonna change um I'm, I'm not saying changing um i'm just gonna introduce a new strategy that uh, we have been working on for some time um uh, but we never really talked about it um but i believe that it is time for us to uh, try to introduce uh, this uh, strategy um so let me have the slide to uh, guide us a little bit all right so how can we save the reefs all right so this is a strategy uh that uh, we try to uh, implement in Malaysia, um, which is called a uh, reef resilience. Um, so it's what what is reef re resilience? Um, let me just explain using this graph. All right. So imagine this is a coral, a live coral, a colorful live coral, still alive. Uh, and when it's hit by uh, global warming, so water temperature increases from time to time, and during prolonged heat, um, so the corals will turn bleaching, as you can see, it turned white just now, and then compounded with local threats. Now it turns gray um, so that the coral will not be able to survive uh, the bleaching period uh, and it will eventually die. So over time, when uh, corals die, uh, algae will start to take over. And this is what we call a uh, phase shift, as I mentioned, uh, causes the ecosystem destabilization. So what we are trying to introduce here is to try to build reef resilience. And how does reef resilience work? All right. So we try to help the corals to build resistance against disturbance. And then hopefully in that process, it will recover to its original function, all right? So let's use this uh, graphic to explain a little bit. So uh, imagine coral is currently bleaching, all right? Uh, if we do a lot of uh, removal of local threats, okay? As the threats that I've mentioned earlier on, we actually help to build uh, resilience over the corals. So during bleaching event, when they happen, uh, when the water goes back to normal, all right? The temperature goes down, corals can recover, have a higher chance of recovery. And when they have uh, recover, as I mentioned, resilience uh, will have to function back to its original uh, state. So coral will start to repopulate itself, all right? And also have uh, more biodiversity, increased biodiversity. And we'll have uh, herbivorous fish. If we remove the local threats, no more uh, overfishing. We have a lot of uh, herbivorous fish to come and fit on the algae so that the corals uh, will continue to populate uh, in the whole reef area. So this is how a uh, basic concept of uh, resilience, right? It, it can be very complex, but I try to simplify it in a way that we all can understand, right? So how do we actually build resilience, right? So we know about the concept of resilience. How do we build them? 
there's a, I'm just going to talk about four different strategies, right? Um, higher level strategy, which is a, have a marine protected area, and also uh, involving a co-management system where we encourage local participation, uh, which is local stakeholders, including local communities, uh, resort operators, uh, local state uh, and state government, and also federal government to work together to uh, try to build a management of our marine resources and have more marine protected area. All right, so we have regulations and enforcement in this area. We can actually try to reduce um, threats to the ocean, uh, to the reefs. The second strategy is managing disturbances. Uh, how do we manage disturbances? Uh, is try to um, look at things like uh, monitor coral bleaching events, all right? Um, and also we are working with uh, NOAA, uh, trying to work on this project of uh, building resilience. And also we have reports of uh, bleaching that we send to uh, NOAA so that we can keep track and try to recalibrate the NOAA satellite system so that we have um, early warning system that, oh, bleaching is going to happen soon. So we be prepare ourselves to uh, do some mitigation methods to avoid that the uh, corals being uh, further disrupted. All right. And then, as I mentioned, uh, we want to reduce the local threat. So uh, threat reduction, uh, we can do things like uh, coral predator control. Um, and one of the things that we do is like ghost net removal. Um, so besides that, these are just two examples. We can do things like uh, try to um, reduce uh, our overfishing demand. So try to feed uh, sustainably on our seafood. Uh, try to reduce uh, single-use plastics that cause problems to the reefs. Uh, try to reduce uh, pollution into the ocean. So these are the things that uh, one of the strategies that we will work on. All right. Uh, another thing that uh, people can go is to support uh, all these eco-friendly uh, dive centers known as uh, green fins. So green fins is a eco-friendly diving etiquette where reef check our assessor will assess the operations of dive centers and um, whether they are green fins or not. So we give them like scoring every single year. So they, if they improve, we give them a better scoring. They will become um, top members of green fins. So fun fact, um, out of the top 10 green fins member in the world, uh, seven of them are actually dive centers from Malaysia. So we are doing quite well. So we just need to uh, promote and support uh, more of these dive centers and uh, the Green Fins program. All right. So Green Fins also introduce uh, simple things like uh, when you go on a uh, holiday, do not step on corals, no stirring on sediment, no touching or chasing marine organisms, right? Despite them being looking cute and nice, please resist yourself to touch them uh, just for the sake of your social media photo. All right. So try to avoid all these things. Or even buying souvenirs uh, from uh, made from the ocean and uh, reef. Okay, and if you look at carefully, I arranged the uh, system this way: marine protected area, managing disturbance, threat reduction, and finally is uh, rehabilitation. Usually, rehabilitation is the last resort. Um, we don't need to do rehabilitation unless necessary, right? So, if a place is we know there's history of corals, coral reefs, and being damaged and we need to uh, rehabilitate, then we will work on it to rehabilitate. So this is what uh, our objective is. If we know that the reef is destroyed due to certain incidents, then we can try to rehabilitate. So to increase, uh, to speed up the process of re reef recovery. But um, having said this strategy, there are certain strategies that can be only done at uh, people at uh, trained level. So for example, this red uh, tra uh, rectangular shows that uh, Organizations like NGOs, like us, uh, government uh, agencies, uh, trained scientists uh, will be able to do all this for, all right? And for the more known uh, public or the public that has a little bit of knowledge, uh, you can join and volunteer in these two, threat reduction and rehabilitation. But in rehabilitation, as I mentioned, it has to be monitored by someone trained um, with a scientific background um, have enough knowledge to understand how ecosystem works so that we do not waste effort on doing rehabilitation but it doesn't come up with uh, outcome positive uh, positive outcomes and results right so it has to be monitored and be done carefully and a monitoring program in place right so this green part threat reduction is usually uh, you can join any of our activities uh, even any green green size center organizers any uh, threat reduction activities uh, you can take part or yourself uh, like I mentioned, the single uh, use item, you can try to reduce using them. So you're actually contributing into this resilience strategy of threat reduction. Okay. So 
Uh, as I mentioned just now, different organizations uh, have uh, worked on all four strategies, and this is what BriefCheck Malaysia uh, is trying to do. Uh, ultimately, we try to achieve a sustainable management of coral reef in Malaysia. So this is in line with uh, the national uh, commitment to the sustainable development goals, and we are more focused on uh, life below water. Of course, we still have others, uh, but our main focus is on the number 40. All right, uh, we try to introduce collaboration between stakeholders uh, into management, monitoring, research conservation, and advocacy. And uh, the core thing that we have been doing and we will not stop doing is to continue monitoring the reef of health over 200 sites. All right, uh, and now because of our monitoring program, we know that we have the data, we know what's going on. We have uh, committed ourselves into three long-term projects on three islands, uh, which is Tioman, Mantanani, and now uh, islands of uh, Johor Mersing. All right, so uh, our organization is very small. We only have about uh, 14 staff now. Uh, most of them, uh, well, in fact, all of them are actually youth, except for my boss. Um, but he's the one who gives us the freedom to uh, work uh, in this, all right? And a little bit more of Reef Check, what do we do? Uh, there are four core programs that we do. Eco Action is where I mentioned about uh, training uh, volunteers to become citizen uh, diverse, citizen science divers to collect data for us. So the data I showed you earlier on is thanks to our volunteers who are certified as eco diver. They are the ones who help us collect the data. Um, and we have a little bit of science. We want to understand more about resilience and uh, rehabilitation and coral bleaching uh, monitoring. Uh, advocacy is where we try to promote uh, awareness and also work on policy change. And management is something where we've tried to work uh, collaboratively with people on the ground to try to manage the reefs together. So eventually, and this four main program will drive a bit further, where from our data, we will increase our survey and monitoring so that this data contributes to our conservation strategy and planning. Uh, science, as I mentioned, try to understand and implement a resilience concept. Uh, and sustainable management, where we try to work with government agencies, uh, private sectors, to try to build a sustainable tourism and also livelihood uh, to the local communities. And this is where we have the long-term commitment through our management. We try to work with uh, the stakeholders, uh, have a long-term commitment with them. And so hopefully uh, the local champion uh, will be born uh, and then take charge and manage the reefs on their own. Now, what else can an individual do? All right, so uh, remember the strategy that I mentioned, uh, there are certain things that individuals can do. Um, so what I, uh, a ways to remember it is uh, you need to have skills. What are the skills? Share, knowledge, involve, lead, and support. All right, what do I mean by sharing? So now we have social media. So what we can do is to share and spread the awareness around, all right? Um, use visuals, uh, use your networks, use your opportunity to try to talk to people, uh, start with your family, start with your friends, try to educate them why we need to do all these things. And... Uh, yeah, encourage uh, your young uh, family member in, uh, to start from young, all right? Uh, like this photo. Uh, this is a powerful photo where a parent actually trying to encourage uh, her daughter to pick up uh, her trash uh, during the international coastal cleanup, right? And then you share it with your network uh, so that the knowledge will be um, spread around, all right? Um, it's also important to do a little bit of, uh, to understand a little bit more, get some knowledge. Now with uh, information at own fingertips, can do a lot of Google search, look for background, search for background uh, before you volunteer for any organization, check whether they are uh, uh, legit or not, uh, what they are doing has long-term commitment or not. So these are the important uh, information because with knowledge is power, but with power comes uh, with great power comes great responsibility. You don't want to be doing things for the sake of feeling, ah, I feel good because I do one touch and go project and that's it. Actually, you didn't really have a long-term uh, objective. So it's very important to have uh, all this knowledge shared around with your friends and family. Now, getting involved, uh, organizing campaigns, participating in events. Um, if you need to do like uh, this kind of colorful of activism, please go ahead and do it. We need to spread the awareness uh, drastically, all right? And you can also participate and organize uh, things like uh, simple things like coastal cleanup. Um, so we have international coastal cleanup organized every single year in September. Uh, you can organize your local teams, collect the trash, send the data to us, and then we'll have a uh, knowledge of what's happening uh, in the whole of Malaysia. All right. Uh, what I mean by lead here is actually uh, live among the majority, understand the local community. 
Um, so if you want to do something like change, we need to have long-term commitment with the local community. So start within your community. You don't have to go uh, other place and tell people, uh, oh, you should do this and do this. Start with our own uh, community and slowly this awareness will spread around, right? Uh, lastly, uh, is to support. Support uh, in terms of uh, volunteering yourself uh, into activities like this uh, one here, conduct uh, surveys with us. Uh, and also contribute, if you do not have the uh, energy or uh, commitment, you can contribute in terms of uh, funds. To keep our uh, organization going, uh, we need a lot of support in terms of funding. So one of the campaigns that we are running uh, soon is called uh, Global, uh, Global Giving Tuesday, which is on 1st of uh, December, where you can contribute in terms of monetary funds. Um, the link will be shared on our uh, social media, we've checked social media. Um, so check out on the 1st of December, the campaign runs for 24 hours. You can uh, contribute uh, whatever you can uh, in that way, all right? So all these things are what you individually can do. Another thing that I want to introduce here is actually uh, innovation on how we actually, uh, me and my friends, Quack, Serena and Feeling, all four of us are marine biologists, uh, try to create a card game uh, which is interactive, but at the same time educational so that we can spread the awareness using these tools. Sometimes talking about uh, reef conservation can be quite challenging, quite serious topic, right? Even now, um, I'm being a bit very serious talking about all these serious topics. So I would like to use this card game uh, to try to uh, generate, uh, stimulate uh, discussion and understanding. So in this card game, we introduce uh, real threats and issues, things that really happening in Malaysia based on true stories. Uh, also, we introduce iconic species, and like recently, we have conducted a uh, competition to find out what is our national marine uh, animal. And uh, from our Facebook uh, and our social media, all voted for dugong. All right, so dugong is now the new uh, icon for marine. All right, um, and our card game, we try to incorporate a fun element so that uh, it's not always serious, gloomy, end of the world kind of thing. Uh, there's always opportunity for us to spread the awareness. Uh, and this card game uh, is a wide audience. Uh, range from um, 12 and above, different background, even if you don't have any marine background, uh, this is a useful tool for you to uh, educate uh, people in terms of uh, marine uh, knowledge. Um, so we have NGOs and even dive centers like uh, using this card game, like one of the, uh, if you have listened to uh, Marisat Seagrass uh, talk, uh, festival talk yesterday, one of the dive centers, uh, Do Young Dive Center, uh, using, uh, incorporated this card game into their package of uh, diving trick. So this is uh, one of the things that uh, you can use. And the best part is uh, we have a great news to share was that uh, last month uh, we have uh, won an international award uh, as the uh, best uh, non-digital completed uh, game uh, at this eight international educational uh, games competition. So yeah, hopefully this will contribute a little bit more uh, in terms of uh, awareness, creating awareness uh, within Malaysian community. And uh, if you want, you can check out our website, uh, www.reefsticks.com to purchase uh, this uh, card. Um, and uh, for your information, we have only less than 10 decks now in stock. Uh, we have new plans for 2021, so stay tuned. Check us out on our social media uh, and wait for the good news, what we have uh, in line for 2021, okay? Um, so basically, what I'm trying to say, uh, how do we, to, to summarize the whole thing, how do we actually save coral reefs, is that everybody has a role, all right? So I take this quote from Edmund Burke, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. So every one of us has important roles, uh, has different roles. You don't have to be a marine biologist to do uh, to save the reefs, right? Because everybody, if we have a role in uh, destroying the planet, we can also take a role in reversing it. So even if you are good in marketing, you can try to do use your marketing skills to try to promote awareness about reef. Uh, if you have engineering uh, background, maybe you want to come up with some engineering solutions. Uh, so if, if you don't have uh, all this kind of background, even if you're a lawyer, you can try to push for policy change, uh, more uh, law enforcement. So uh, if you're civil service, uh, try to encourage more within the civil service to become uh, more aware about environmental uh, movements. So everybody has a role to play, all right? So um, hero is not one person, it's every one of us. So that's why I put that uh, video just to show that everybody can be a superhero if we just start within uh, our own community, start within our family and friends, all right? Um, so 
I guess that's it. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to put in the comments. Uh, I'll try my best to answer based on my limited knowledge. So thank you for the staying tuned with us. And I hope I did not exceed the time given to me. No, you did a good job, Chai Mei. You did not exceed the time. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Chai Ming, for Thank your you. really uh, informative, um, informative uh, sharing with the, with us about coral reef, and it's so amazing. We can easily understand about the infographics because you put so many uh, if, uh, graphics in the slides. Exactly, uh, and it's also very congratulations to you for the award. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hope you will receive more awards for mistakes. <laughs> uh, hopefully, yeah, that will help uh, to propel the, uh, you know, the uh, educational uh, tool. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Now we are moving to Q and A session. Mm -hmm. So the first question from Faz Fazni Ibrahim: uh, How is the pollution, nutrient, and sewage in 2020 is high? We sh we have CMCO right now, so the pollution rates should be low. Well, so um, this is actually quite interesting um, because uh, we have to remember that the effects of all this pollution, it's not uh, short term, right? So one is discharged into the ocean, the nutrients there will contribute uh, into the growth of our day. So it will take time to stay uh, in the water. So this is what we call a lag period. So uh, it also goes to show that the current CMCO period, um, it's not enough for our reefs to recover from many years of impact, right? So the 2020 data also shows not just that uh, what happened during the year is because we collect every 12 months. So it is accumulatively over 12 months what has happened over the years. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we will need to do a little bit of uh, water quality testing to uh, cross correlate um, this result. But the data that we collected on the substrate is something at the bottom. It shows that there is an increase um, and also uh, it shows there's a lag period, so this is what we need to address. That's why we need to help to build resilience into the coral reef ecosystem so that they can resist uh, this kind of disturbance and recover over time. Mm, very informative, very clear explanation. Yeah, so, so it's very important to understand that once you do, we created the damage, it's going to stay there for a while. Mm. So yeah. the best way, ultimately the yeah. best way to save the reef is to prevent this disturbance. Mm-hmm. I think we, we, we can't really, yeah. yeah, yes. I think we can't really assume that MCO, CMCO, or pandemic will solve everything, will dilute everything, because mm -hmm. it takes time after, just like what Chiming said, it's over a few decades of pollution, it's just not over a day or two. Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have another also, question. Sorry. Sorry, Chami. Yeah, no, some things also like uh, if, if it's raining and then the river discharge that all goes and end up in the ocean. So these mm -hmm. kind of things that contribute to uh, what we call the disturbance into the uh, reef system. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have another question from Hong Yao Hong. Are mm -hmm. the white tip of the coral sign of a coral bleaching or are they actually growing? Okay, it depends on uh, species. All right. Um, so some species, uh, when you look at the white tip at the top, all right, it's, it's actually a growing tip. All right. Um, so when bleaching happens, usually it will be um, over a large area of a colony of coral. So we really have to look at the, uh, the coral itself to be able to tell whether it's uh, just a growing tip or it's bleaching. Usually bleaching comes with uh, high light and also uh, high water temperature. So if you know that water temperature is high uh, for a few uh, weeks already, and then the colony bleaching pattern is uh, very uh, gradual, right? Um, so then we know it's bleaching. If it's not, it has nice color and just the tip that is white, then it's actually mm -hmm. a growing tip. So then uh, that's not bleaching. So that's, that's how we differentiate uh, bleaching mm -hmm. from uh, the normal mm -hmm. growing tip of coral. Yeah. Okay. Now we are moving to the third uh, question. From Farid Abdullah, 
You mentioned overfishing and your data was taken in the marine park. I understand no fishing activities at marine park, also no trolling. Can you tell us why your data showed the reef fishes uh, are declining? Okay, so there's two ways to it. Uh, first thing is our data mm -hmm. is not just within marine parks. Uh, there are certain areas uh, which are outside of marine parks uh, that we collect the uh, data. So for example, like Los Milan in Perak, uh, some places in uh, Sabah, which is outside of marine park, so it incorporates everything. Secondly, is uh, this is possibly the effect of overfishing in the past that the corals have not recovered. Uh, sorry, the fish uh, abundance have not recovered over time. So it goes to, back to the uh, explanation I have earlier. So some of the impacts are uh, long lasting, right? So um, we haven't really recovered from the predatory uh, rate from uh, the previous uh, past kind of uh, disturbances. So this is actually uh, what we are trying to address. And of course, uh, if you look in the news, uh, the Department of Fisheries have caught a lot of uh, all these illegal fishers that are from uh, uh, cross borders. So they are doing their job in enforcement, but uh, when they caught them, some of the fish are already being caught uh, out from the ocean really. So this also contributes into the uh, declining of the uh, fish abundance. Mm, okay, very interesting. Didn't know mm -hmm. this part of interpretation. So the next question yeah. we have uh, from Hidaya Latif. So she is asking that there are there are alternatives to preserve corals, uh, such as using tires and sunk boat as a new home for corals. Does this alternative sustain a long term life for the coral reefs? And is, is it the same as the natural coral or is it different? Um, so definitely it's different from the natural corals because mm -hmm. natural system, uh, they grow on their own. Uh, but when you put artificial things into the water, like tires and uh, sunken boat, um, this depends on the objective of why we are doing it. So sometimes uh, we don't want to overdo it until it becomes the ocean as a dumping place for all these things. Right, so like tires, for example, has been proven that it's, uh, it doesn't work. Right, uh, sunken boat, some people put it in just to uh, attract divers away from diving in the natural reef. Uh, it could help in a way, but uh, we always go back to the main objective is that if we can prevent the threat from the first place, that would be the best uh, number one strategy that we would use first. Then only we go for uh, preserving corals using other alternative methods, uh, which are like using artificial reefs and so on and so forth. Unless areas that are badly damaged, we know the history of it and being damaged that we need to rehabilitate, then uh, we will put in some artif uh, artificial alternative methods to help them uh, grow faster. So this is a uh, very uh, important uh, things that we need to understand uh, because we don't want to end up the idea of doing it becomes like people just dumping trash into the ocean. Um, so we need to deal this carefully, yeah? So it's like sinking, uh, sinking boats uh, to provide a new home for fishes, then it's a different story. Then we have to place it a bit further away from the natural reef so that it doesn't hit the corals, but it's good enough for the fish uh, to use it as a home um, for growth, uh, as, a, as a nursery uh, ground as well, but they're close to the natural reef, but not close enough. So all these things will require some scientific study, understanding the site selection. So there's a lot of uh, complexity in doing all these things. We need to understand that. So it's definitely one, different from the natural reef. Two, uh, these alternatives need to be done carefully, studied, and have uh, proper monitoring over time. Okay, so there are two, the, uh, two opinions from you. And then we have another question also from Faz Fazni, the second question that he asked. Once the corals were covered by the algae, we, uh, which I assume they already died and suddenly fishes, herbivores, come and feed the algae, uh, is it the corals will recover? Okay, um, this is gonna be a long uh, process of recovery. So when the algae start growing, if you have enough of uh, herbivore fishes, to, uh, to start feeding and grazing on the algae. So they will remove algae from the surface and they will um, sort of like uh, have some uh, scratches uh, in that part. So they clear up some space for the corals larvae 
to next time when uh, during coral uh, reproduction, the coral larvae have a space to settle down and grow on its own. So that's why herbivory is very important uh, and corals can recover, but this will take a long, long process. So yeah, if we have herbivory to eat uh, the algae control, clear the space, we create some space and then the process will go again. Corals larvae will settle down and then will grow back to become a colony and become coral reefs. So this is how the process goes through. Wow, seems like our audience, they are all very into coral reefs. I think they probably have gone for diving or scuba snorkeling before. Yeah, yeah the questions are, are very Quite deep. <laughs> yeah, it's very High level technical. questions, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm going to ask you just a little bit more like chill questions or personal. Yeah. Maybe you can share with us like what's your best and best and worst memory or the toughest things that you have gone through um, conserving corals like throughout your 10 over years doing this? Yep. Uh, so, sorry, could you repeat a little bit? I lost you at the beginning of the question. So your best and your worst memories working in the coral conservation, coral conservation. industry. Oh, okay. Um, let me start with the worst. Um, <laughs> so actually, the worst one is to see that a lot of times uh, that when we try to uh, do all this conservation uh, effort, and then there comes a big project approved uh, with certain, uh, I try to word this diplomatically, uh, with a certain support, and then uh, the project goes through, uh, then it, it hurts us because like a lot of effort we have done to get people to understand that we need a uh, natural environment. We need to live together with uh, the natural ecosystem. And then here comes suddenly a big project and just destroy everything. So that hurts and that's the lowest moment uh, that we felt uh, most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the best moment is always when, uh, whenever you see, um, I, I go for very small wins, um, like uh, friends who doesn't know, about, uh, who doesn't care about environment, but over the years, when I talk to them and try to influence them, uh, they change. Uh, I take a very, very simple example is that uh, like shark fins uh, consumption. Um, ah. I was the only one, you know, in Chinese weddings, uh, we always yeah. have people serve uh, shark fin. Uh, exactly. Like 10 years ago, I was the only one that refused to take a shark fin. And I explained to them mm -hmm. why and everything. They always laugh at me. And everything. But five years later, when it's my peers who get married, a lot of them say, oh, I refuse shark fin, so you better come to my wedding. So they kind wow. of, wow. so those kind of, kind of uh, you know, small things. They listen yeah. to you. <laughs> I, I think, I so, think the, yeah. the younger generation, like, they kind of, like, really take heed on this thing. Like, I think they were all, that somehow maybe discouraged by their parents, like, you must have shark fin and things like that. But maybe in their inner heart, they feel like, Actually, I don't want shark fin because of what Chiming has told me. <laughs> but I think eventually when everyone is, is refusing shark fins, then people getting more encouraged to also mm -hmm. take, take the same steps. Yeah. So I think it's getting better and better nowadays. Yeah. So remember I mentioned about the, uh, the individual, you need to have skills, part of the L, which is lead. Uh, so sometimes within our community, we, we start within our friends and family first. So it's, mm -hmm. it's the hardest barrier to get through. So yes. once you reach to, you know, you, you are able to convince or influence your family and your friends, then it's a lot easier to uh, influence the public. But uh, of course, uh, I'm not the extremist type. So start, start slow, start with a baby step. Uh, although we do not have enough time, but start with baby step because eventually it will go very far. Mm, yeah. So we are running a little bit out of time. No, actually, we still have like two or three minutes. So mm -hmm. we have about okay. three more questions for you, Chinese. You see, yeah, three so more questions. Okay, okay. <laughs> so we're gonna just pick one. We're so happy. But yeah, but later on, maybe you just take a bit of time to reply them in in the Facebook. There are two more questions that have yet to be replied. We'll let you know mm -hmm. which questions. But now we're gonna read one of the questions, uh, from Izarina. So her question mm -hmm. is, as one of the NGOs working in coral conservation for more than 10 years, how do you see the changes in awareness, participation and cooperation among stakeholders, government agencies and local communities towards conserving our coral reefs? 
Um, okay, so based on my personal observation and uh, some of uh, our engagement with different different stakeholders, uh, we have seen that the awareness uh, level has increased over time. A lot of people are now being a bit more aware about uh, conserving coral reefs, um, but there is still a lot more out there who doesn't know about it. Um, so I think we are at a phase where uh, we are no longer need uh, we we no longer have to just focus on awareness. We need to move into uh, action. We need to do action. So we used to spend a lot of time doing awareness, but it, awareness still needs to go. Uh, and carry on must be done. But at the same time now, we should emphasize more on uh, getting things done because uh, certain uh, part of the community already have awareness. We need to get these people to uh, take the action. All right. So uh, in short answer, yes, there is uh, some in, uh, increase in terms of awareness, but we still have a long way to go. Yeah. No. Uh, thank you for joining our last event for this year to have chiming to close our 2020 GDKL event. But before we let you go, what would be your advice to the younger generation who wants to be like you? Ooh. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people that um, look yeah. up to you as a role model. So it's very important that you give them a few of uh, your advice. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm just doing my small little part. <laughs> um, so what I advise, uh, I said that um, it is back back to the uh, things that I've said that uh, you know uh, the mm -hmm. only uh, thing that necessary for evil to triumph is the good men do nothing. So uh, instead of uh, you know just uh, harping on things, try to do take action now, uh, regardless of your background. It doesn't have to be a marine um, mm -hmm. ecology or biodiversity kind of background. Whatever it is, incorporate a lifestyle that is more sustainable. Um, start from yourself and then you spread around with your family before you move it to your friends, right? Uh, the mm -hmm. next thing is uh, we need to support each other because along the line of conservation, you need to understand that it sometimes can be a very lonely journey. It can be quite depressing at times. <laughs> so sometimes we need support and motivation from our peers. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And it doesn't pay well in terms of because we are NGOs, yeah. right? So we are not uh, corporate level kind of uh, mm -hmm. Uh, salary. Um, so yeah, you need to be prepared to be out there to do the tough work. And uh, more importantly is to um, understand uh, surrounding your community. So, you know, within your circle. Um, so by doing that, then you will have a long term commitment and uh, engagement mm -hmm. to make some change. Yeah. Very well said, Chiming. Thank you so much. I think the, the key word is literally just start from yourself, like start with small actions, right? Yeah. Yeah. So don't, don't, don't uh, I mean, you can always go for ideal big goals, but uh, you need to step the mm -hmm. small start steps small. pass through the yeah. others before you reach there. Yeah. So mm -hmm. go through that phase. Yeah. I think maybe some of you can just learn from Chiming. I mean, it, everything started from volunteering. So once you have started volunteering, mm -hmm. then you will see things slowly, bit by bit, and then you will begin to see the bigger picture. And then you will learn that, hey, um, my small action really matters, and it has brought me to this stage. Which brings me to my second point here. Just like what Chai Ming said, we are not corporates. We are just volunteers. We are volunteering <laughs> our time, our effort, and we are learning a lot throughout from our speakers and organizing this event. So we only want one thing from all of you, audience today. Please just follow our social media, our Facebook, our Instagram, our YouTube channel, because every virtual events are recorded and you can always replay and rewatch uh, the previous uh, recorded events. And then all the Facebook and Instagrams, we are constantly um, putting important uh, awareness information about different, different uh, themes every month. So. You lose nothing if you follow us. And yeah, please, please do follow us. And because today is our last event, last virtual event for year 2020, we are really honored to have Chiming to close this <laughs> for us. And without further ado, I'm going to just invite uh, our team leader. His name is Simpson to just uh, say a few words. Simpson, hello. Hi, Hi everyone. Hello. Um, Thanks, uh, Shivani, for, for the intro, and uh, thanks, Idati, as well. And thanks a lot, uh, Chiming. 
Um, I see in the in the comments over there, somebody said you are an an inspiration, chiming. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's my colleague. He's just playing around. No. <laughs> but well, I've been holding uh, throughout the entire session. Yes, I agree. I totally agree on that. You are an inspiration, and um, well, people say uh, all, not all heroes wear cape. Perhaps you are a hero who wear a panda hat. <laughs> <laughs> that's you. <laughs> Well, uh, okay, all right. Thank um, you, thank you. Uh, I feel honored. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thanks a lot uh, for, for the sharing and uh, really thanks a lot for all this uh, very informative sharing uh, as well. And um, I would like to use this, uh, take this opportunity to uh, actually have a shout out to everyone. Um, well, <clears throat> well, um, my name is Simpson Tan and uh, I'm the team lead uh, of uh, Green Rings KL. And uh, Green Rings KL in general, it is an uh, informal networking platform. And uh, we try to have an event every two months and uh, we do it on every last Thursday of uh, every two months. And right now it's uh, MCO and so on like due to COVID. So we have it online and um, we usually do it uh, on like 8.30 to 10 p.m. Uh, and yeah, uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone. It's not possible to, to do it alone. Um, like we have Izati and Shimei uh, with us today. Uh, and well, <clears throat> Uh, what is it? So, <laughs> so yes, I, I would like to thank uh, our team. Uh, it, I mean, it has been uh, amazing working with uh, the entire Green Rings team. So let me just uh, briefly introduce everyone. Um, over here, we have uh, our advisors, Bernard Eng and Tan Shime, right? And also we have uh, some veterans, uh, what is it, uh, advisor. Uh, they are Gregers, uh, Matthias, Steve McCoy, and also Tyrone Nisa. Well, thanks a lot, uh, everyone, for your help. And uh, Simpson Tan, I am Simpson Tan, uh, the team lead or we call it CEO. We have Daniel as well, uh, who have, I mean, who have provided us with all the posters you have seen on all this wall. We have Jason. Jason is actually right, uh, right behind. I mean, at behind the scene right now, he is the technical guy. He, he, I mean, every technical things uh, we, we throw to him, and uh, he's, he's amazing in this. And we have Ku. Uh, he helps in marketing, and he has a very passionate guy with lots of ideas. We have Austin as well. Uh, Austin handles our social media. We have our Facebook, Instagram, everything is done by him. And also, who else we have? Uh, we have Izati, the content writer. And uh, well, whatever the content uh, uh, is actually done by Izati. And at the same time, I would like to have a shout out to our previous uh, team. I mean, sorry, uh, the team members, uh, especially towards uh, Gojain, uh, the, the head of uh, marketing, uh, marketing uh, Jeffrey Young, Jeffrey uh, was, I mean, uh, well, he, he stays all the way in Nepal, but he, I mean, in the past, he came all the way to KL just for the events. And uh, we have Matthew George, and also we have Gladys as well. So, I mean, all these people, they have uh, joined us, uh, I mean, helped us since the beginning of uh, Green Rings team, uh, Green Rings formation back when it was like, uh, well, close to three years now. So, well, thanks a lot, everyone. So over here, I would like to, uh, I mean, at the same time, I would like to shout out as well. Uh, we are looking for youth volunteers. So especially, uh, I mean, if, if you are uh, passionate, for example, in organizing uh, events and also uh, perhaps uh, working on social media and, um, and anything um, in general, uh, organizing events is not just events. There are like tons of background work. So if you are passionate in all these things, if you want to join us, well, do drop us a message uh, on like our Facebook, Instagram, and uh, you can even like uh, watch, uh, I mean, uh, and everyone uh, can actually watch our recorded sessions in our what is it, YouTube, and also uh, uh, everything's in Facebook as well. So yeah, do like us, join us, and, and, and yeah, stay with us. And also, uh, most importantly, I would like to thank all the uh, participants and audience. You guys are awesome. And um, yeah, like uh, Asmin Chi said, you are an inspiration at uh, at uh, Chai Ming. And I would say... Thank you, thank you. It's my honor. <laughs> I feel honored. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is really an inspiration. And I would like to I mean, uh, tell the entire team as well, uh, the Green Ring Scale team, you are an inspiration as well. I've learned a lot with you guys. And, uh, and also thanks to the, the previous speakers as well who have joined us. So yeah, um, well... Uh, that's it for uh, from me and uh, thanks a lot Chiming for uh, wrapping up our 2020. Uh, I guess uh, Green Green Scale will see you guys in uh, January. 
of everything. Yay! Thank you so Yay. much, Susan. <laughs> Yay! So, um, it's a wrap, right? Yeah. Thanks yeah. everyone Thank for so joining our sessions today. We you can always always replay rewatch in our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. And last but not least, please stay safe during this pandemic. Keep up the good work in whatever green small steps that they are doing. And thank you once again to Chiming for your time and effort today in preparing such a beautiful yeah. slide. Thank I'm you so, so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Right. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Bye. See you next year. And Bye. Merry Christmas. <laughs>